Hang on, I'm coming. I'm almost there. Hang on. Fuck. God damn it. Yo, I'm. Uh, hello. Hi. What's up, Goth Gamer Nation? It's. It is your boy. I'm here to show you another. Um. An another absolute gem from the gaming. Uh. Vault. I'm here. I'm here. It is. This is. Pri Start the video. Night long. <coughs> Night long. Union City Conspiracy is a point-and-click adventure game developed by Italian studio Tristision and published by Team 17 for PC in 1998. Tristision began in '91 and put out a handful of adventure games for Amiga and DOS throughout the '90s, most of which are charming time capsules of the era. And you can feel the plucky, earnest attempt at making a fun adventure story within these, but none of them became household names exactly. In the 2000s, Tristision would absorb two smaller Italian studios, Pixel Storm and Motherbrain, becoming Italy's largest game developer for three years. Because while they did start to see some success making football games and a number of mobile titles, their publisher in 2002 was Cryo, a developer and publishing company that put out a number of fun titles until 2001's Frank Herbert's Dune, a critical and financial failure that they couldn't recover from. Without Cryo's funding, shareholders decided to file for liquidation, leaving two incomplete games in limbo, Zidane Football Generation and Popeye Rush for Spinach, a loss that the game industry at large may never fully recover from. Well, if you were concerned, don't worry, we did get that Popeye Racing game a couple years later for the Game Boy Advanced. So balance was restored, I'd say. Reviews for Nightlong were mostly on the negative side. If I can guess as to the state of adventure games, in 98, the amount of adventure games coming out slowed down as their productions became more ambitious and expensive. Or if you were a hardcore fan of early adventure games, you'd more likely consider adventure games uh, to have been long dead at that point, with anything coming out in the late 90s and early 2000s, the extended death rattle of a genre, dispatched single-handedly by a fun little game about magic books. The thing is, right around here, you got games like Grim Fandango, Blade Runner, The Last Express, the Pandora Directive, Ripper, all games with big ideas, bigger budgets, and bigger tits. So if, say, a studio were to put out a serviceable point-and-click adventure game that maybe met the requirements but didn't strive to be much more than a respectable example of the genre, it's gonna look a bit passe. PC Gamer in particular would point out Nightlong's unfortunate proximity to Blade Runner, as it is ostensibly an homage to Blade Runner, the film. So, kinda sucks that not too long ago a game called Blade Runner came out and did the whole Blade Runner thing to uh, many people's satisfaction. PC Gaming World would give them one of the more forgiving reviews, giving the caveat that due to the scarcity of classic third-person point-and-click adventure games, Nightlong should be appreciated and treasured for what it is. The last drops of classic adventure games are spilling on the floor, so now we gotta suck it out of the carpet. <laughs> because nobody's dealing anymore. Of course, I took some artistic license to that quote, but the general sense of desperation was there. And I, I pick up on that sort of thing. Nightlong doesn't do the best job introducing its world, but luckily I have the manual to flesh out some of the particulars of what leads to the opening cutscene. By the way, can we just marvel for a second at how rad as shit this box art is? Like there is just a lot to drink in before we even touch the story. Uh, for starters, hate to break it to you, but we do play as this ghoul in sunglasses instead of this badass Matrix villain over here. I also thought it worth noting that it is recommended by the original Sci-Fi Channel, something I don't remember any other game touting. And incidentally, it is also not for rent or for hire, so don't do that. Was any of that interesting? I don't even know. Hello? Nobody was there. I don't know why I did that. Alright, so let me set the scene here. It's the year 2099. Advances in technology have yielded cheap, renewable energy. In this grim future that seemingly grows more and more plausible by the day, countries are controlled by corporate puppet masters, the most powerful of which is the United States of the New Order. The world's true superpower is a corporation called Genesis, which controls nearly all transportation, energy, medicine, and laser technology which I guess is an important pillar of their monopoly. And then there's a sentence in here that I'm, I'm trying to understand, but I don't, so I'll just say it. It says, science has made the government redundant. I'm not sure what that is telling me, so take from that what you will. Uh, surprisingly, 
The world is kind of peaceful under the rule of these faceless bureaucrats. But everyone is kind of bored and sad, so obviously the next market for Genesis to corner is cyberspace. The net, the old tube works. People are so depressed by the dystopian Orwellian nightmare they live in that it only makes sense to sell them VR simulation to escape into. Joshua Reeve, former soldier, current private detective, is contacted by a man named Hugh Martins, governor of Union City and Joshua's former commanding officer. Back in their old army days, Hugh saved Joshua's life so he has felt indebted to him, offering him a favor to cash in at any time. And that time is frickin' today. A subversive terrorist group has been organizing attacks on Genesis-owned property. This damages Hugh's political reputation as Genesis was his supporter during the campaign for his election. So, if he doesn't do something to remedy this, his position may be in jeopardy. Hugh had already sent in an operative named Simon Ruby undercover as a journalist, but they've lost contact with him and assumed the worst. So Joshua gets dropped off at Simon's apartment building to begin his investigation with instructions to call for backup if he meets up with the terrorists. Joshua breaks into the apartment and finds a report that Simon had sent Hugh, explaining that he made contact with the terrorists, though he doubts that their motives are as simple as they once thought. He had plans to meet up with them at their undisclosed underground headquarters last night when they lost contact with him. He also finds a note with the name of a subway station and time, so that's where he heads next. After being shown a photo, a transient at the station recognizes Simon and remembers him walking into a nightclub nearby with a woman. Through a series of classically convoluted actions that include tricking a Frenchman into giving him a membership card by passing off his own bottle of rare wine as a new bottle of rare wine after he scared his wife by putting a dead rat on a roller skate, I'm the giant rat. Joshua finds his way into the club before it opens to avoid having to animate that. Inside he meets the club's owner, Ava Thompson, who awkwardly dodges any questions about Simon Ruby. Though after using the cover they devised in the car ride over, she expresses a bit more candor, but suggests he not get involved. She also makes mention of an abandoned zoo which links to something Simon mentioned in his report. So, after giving Hugh an update on the situation, he has Hugh send him a map of the subway through a public fax machine which is probably the most charming idea I've ever seen in an adventure game. That someone's vision of the future included fax machines affixed to walls in public spaces like payphones. I just wish I had lived to see something so optimistic yet erroneous exist. I just can't get over that. It's it's so dumb, I love it. Anyway, the map of the subway reveals that there is an entrance to the abandoned zoo right next to the nightclub, so we head down there. After dealing with a number of obstacles in the zoo, Joshua finds his way into the terrorist headquarters, where he finds a comatose Simon Ruby, who they have been trying to revive after he was shot through the lung. He does think it odd that the terrorists would care to save him given that they presumably shot him after uncovering his true motives. I mean, he presumes that. Obviously, he doesn't know much about what's going on here. Look at him! Big dunce. That's probably a good stopping point. If you want to experience the story for yourself, uh, you should be intrigued enough at this point. Did that fax machine do nothing for you? Then I can't help you. You're made of stone! Uh, I'll, I'll give you a minute to decide if you want to skip. In the meantime, you guys play World of Horror? I gotta say, I'm in love with the, uh, you know, one-bit animation style. Not quite as gorgeous as Return of the Oberdin, but uh, it certainly has charm. I am having a lot of trouble getting into the actual game, though. But I'm, like, resolute in my goal to get into it. Finding it very hard to uh, focus on what the fuck is happening in this game and enjoy it. I mean, it's one of those things that I look at it and I'm like, well, of course I would like this. This seems great, but the, uh, the, the UI seems like an absolute cluttered mess and the game seems to revolve around randomized encounters and it seems like there's a lot expected of me right off the bat. A lot I should just understand, but I want to keep at it and uh, maybe I'll update you on my progress there. You make your decision? All right, let's, uh, let's get back in there. Spoil the game, shall we? Joshua eavesdrops on a conversation between Ava from the nightclub and a terrorist named Al. They are paranoid that Martins is onto them, 
but don't reveal anything more, so Joshua decides to introduce himself in character once again, claiming to be on the run from Genesis goons and looking for a crew to hang out with. Ava buys his story while Al remains skeptical. Then comes something like eight minutes of succinct exposition. Ruby was assigned to investigate us by his newspaper and by a Stromain HQ was hit last night and all our equipment was wasted. It's put us back. Marcus was with us right from the start. He was investigating Moreau and his VST project. When they burst in and he took a bullet that was meant for me. What we've discovered, Martins was one of his first customers. So Moreau would seem to be the Some creator. Weeks ago, a charred, unidentifiable body was found. We were studying the effects of cyberspace on the human mind. From and that Martins. moment on, strange things began to happen. The mirror, the mirror isn't... Reflect. They explain that Simon was injured in an attack on their main headquarters by Martins' goons. They assure Joshua that they are not the terrorists Martins would have him believe. They began as a group conducting research on the effects of cyberspace, with the aid of a guy who was also killed in the attack named Marcus Sanders. This guy was investigating a cyberspace architect named Moreau, and discovered this secret deep web location in cyberspace that took the form of a horror-themed amusement park. There he found information about something called Project VST. After uncovering this information, Marcus was murdered. A burnt corpse was found in Moreau's home, and the police refused to investigate the incident further, prompting the group of surviving researchers to arm themselves and take matters into their own hands. I'm thinking that's what happened. Um, <coughs> Did you order the rodeo burger? <laughs> These two want Joshua to jack off and open a jack into cyberspace and follow the trail Sanders was on before he was murdered. Before going through with this, he does express surprise that Martins was lying to him from the beginning, so he may not be that much of a dingus. They beam him into the haunted amusement park world, and there is a long stretch of adventure game wankery where nothing of consequence happens. You kill a werewolf. Take that, wolfman. Until finally you find the Diary of Moreau. In it, he chronicles his work on Project VST, without outright stating what that is. But whatever it is, for a while, it was a failure, and though the idea was revolutionary, the current state of it would be fatal to inflict on people. Eventually, Martins gets Genesis to fund VST, and though it's clear that Moreau never really understood the commercial purpose of VST, he eventually discovers that Martins and Genesis have been using it to conduct experiments on human beings kept in a Mexican prison island called Rocas Pardida, which means brown rocks. So it's not the coolest island name I've ever heard of, but it's descriptive at least. Moreau was likely murdered by Martins when he tried to back out of the project and escape. Joshua begins to finally accept that Martins is a big old jerk, and he finds the location of his office in cyberspace, which he teleports to because I, I, I don't know how this whole business works. It's like, he's in the internet right now. He's going to a different website world. Stop yelling at me. So... Boom, we're in Martin's office. We have some trouble with his secretary, but we roofie her chocolates and burst our way in. And on Martin's computer, we find some incriminating shit. Correspondence between Martin's and Genesis, wherein he admits to murdering Sanders and grovels to them, assuring that he'll deal with the little rebellion that's been brewing. Worst of all, because I guess Martins felt like spilling some tea to his Genesis buddies. He reveals that he's been using Joshua, and this supposed life debt is based on a lie. He never meant to save his life. He was protecting a plane that was secretly transporting drugs, and Joshua just happened to be there as well. He's kind of just... He's kind of just... Ah, it's, it's, fuck, man. He's just... Ticked off! My buddy! My war friend from war times! My god! Luckily, he also mentions that he is going to be at Rocas Pardida, and convinces Ava and Al to tag along. Not the two other guys he knocked out, though. The, they're probably dead from that fucking concussion he gave them. On the way to Mexico, the gang formulates a plan of attack. Joshua will enter through a drain and drop the laser defense system so Ava and Al can come in the rear. I don't like that. While skulking around, he finds some cells, and in one of these sits Moreau. They share a conversation, and he promises to bust him out once the other two are inside. He then has a lengthy, audible conversation with Al in the midst of their stealthy infiltration mission. Al, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Joshua gets the fence down, and Ava and Al break in. But after some snooping, they're caught by Martins, who kills Al and takes Ava hostage. 
but after tying a syringe to a blown up surgical glove, Joshua is able to give Ava the means to knock out the guard posted outside her cell. This works out somehow, and we get access to Martins, who tries to plea and bargain with Joshua, but he's having none of it, throwing him in a cell and freeing Ava and Moreau. The three escape and make public Martin's involvement in VST, causing an investigation into the prison and Genesis. If there was ever any moment in the game uh, where it was outright said what VST actually was in detail, then I must have missed it, because even in the closing news report they only refer to it as having something to do with human experimentation. I could be wrong, I could have missed something, but uh, if I did, I don't know, what are you gonna play this? VST is bad. It led to deaths. Martins would have released it knowing that it wasn't ready. That's all you need to know. I'm not good at this. I never claimed to be. He's going to jail now. He's a bad man. And Joshua chooses the one moment in the entire game that he actually would have benefited from wearing sunglasses to whip them off and enjoy that sunrise. On the off chance you chose to abstain from listening to the plot, welcome back. Uh, I think we'd all agree it ain't no Blade Runner. It's a passable romp in the key of cyberpunk. It's not a great story in the slightest, I'll admit that, but it's incredibly charming as an adventure game story. This was sort of all it had to be for the time. This was the sort of thing that was missing for a long time for many people. Uh, I mean, look, would I have liked something more interesting? Yes. Does it bother me that it wasn't interesting? Yes. But there was, and uh, still is, room. <laughs> for something this quaint. A lot of what supersedes any aspect of this game is just the vibe. It's like the thing propelling me wasn't so much the plot or the mystery, I just love the way the game feels. It's a bizarre, nebulous thing that I know I'm not doing a great job of explaining. I couldn't say it's even the atmosphere because that is just as silly as anything else. It's just that it's so specifically of its time and it's quite frankly aged like a fine milk. These are compliments. Uh, everything about the story kind of misses its mark and feels goofy, but by the end when things kind of play out as you'd expect them to, and you know, we don't feel as though anything of consequence happened, I had a smile on my face, and it wasn't entirely because of the hooks I used to set it in place. Joshua is supposed to be a highly capable, badass, sort of, you know, he fought in space wars and he spent years on the rugged streets of Union City, but he mainly comes across as a monotone dork, so... Clearly, I relate to him a lot and thought he was great. Let's just say they became genuinely alarmed, and besides, I didn't know you'd be here. He does some odd shit, though, that makes him more endearing, I think. Nice babe. There's just something about this poster. And you don't even use it for anything, like, he just wants to hang on to it. I don't know, I thought that was kind of interesting, like... We gonna talk about that? Or? I especially love his indifference to possibly murdering a child. Damn. I hope I didn't waste the kid. We never see this dead kid again. Ava's outfit is iconic, but that's the most memorable part of her character. Maybe it's because there are so few breadcrumbs and all the exposition is dumped into long cutscenes, but a lot of it seems just like the shell of a story, so you can be escorted through some fun sci-fi moments. And I think that's fun in a way, but if this isn't a genre you enjoy, or an era of games that you have some nostalgic connection to, then I wouldn't fault you for seeing it as garbage, or as disposable. But I think it's high time I stop skirting around the reality that I... Well, I... I like garbage. Nightlong controls just about as simplistically as you'd want for a game like this. You point, and you left-click to examine, and right-click to interact. You don't really have any kind of heads-up display. Your items appear when you mouse over the bottom of the screen. Item management is a big part of this game. You're gonna be picking up a lot of random junk and figuring out how to utilize it to progress. Some of these instances make sense and lull you into a false sense of real-world logic, but others are incomprehensible, as was the style then. Though I suppose some of the moon logic is lampshaded by the fact that part of this game takes place in cyberspace where things are particularly wacky. It's gonna hit a lot of familiar notes you're sure to see in other adventure games. We got a maze, we've got cheating at carnival games, esoteric puzzle devices, finding Rube Goldberg-like means of dispatching guards. There is a comfort to that. I enjoyed all these staples. It is a perfectly fine example of that. Pretty much 
the only truly egregious puzzle is the last one, which is upsetting not only because of its difficulty, but because of the busy work involved in deciphering a coded message. When so much of this game is just combining items and doing smaller puzzles and feels sort of brisk and light, it's really jarring when all of a sudden you gotta bust out a notebook and figure out an equation, and you may see some kind of value in that experience, but I don't. And some walkthroughs even do their best to get you there on your own, which is admirable, but futile. You found the only thing I dislike more than mazes, homework. If you want to figure out this equation, you can assign letters to these symbols. So it'll look something like ABC times DC equals Having already admitted to enjoying garbage, it should come as no surprise that I love the way this game looks. The pre-rendered environments are all detailed, composed in fun ways, and just a joy to look at, almost always incorporating some animated element to make them feel a bit more alive. I like this one where shot is kind of framed by a broken stained glass window. It's far from the best example of this style, but nonetheless, it, it did the job for me. It got me where I needed to go. I woke up on the floor foaming at the mouth and speaking in furbish. <laughs> Please hug me. Which unfortunately at this point only gets me back to normal. The cutscenes are adorable. They aren't good, they look funny, but um, that's why they're so beautiful. And there's a surprising amount of them. Even with the exposition dumps that span several minutes, there are tons of little incidental clips where you interact with things, and I love that. It feels like a reward for figuring out the correct solution. It's probably the only reason the game needed to span three discs. The voice actors are doing their best with the material they have, but it, it's pure schlock, so it's, it's a little difficult to elevate that much. Quit the wisecracks, Morgan. I'm not in the mood. Your stupid games are beginning to tire me. I know this is your doing. I don't want to go down there again, especially on my own. There are no rats, Mildred. I was down there myself only 10 minutes ago. We've had the rat catchers out three times now, and they couldn't find any. What I appreciated about it was the dated production and quality to it. It's got that compressed kind of fuzzy grain to it. What have you done? You'll find out soon enough, you gullible bastard! Mmm, mmm. I, I like when games sounded like you dropped a speak and spell into a sewer tunnel. Again, these are compliments. I know there's an odd cadence to them, so uh, I, I, I just wanted to remind you. The music is probably the hardest for me to see with rose-colored glasses, mainly because I don't remember it. Like, you could tell me right now that there actually was no soundtrack and I'd buy it because it's either that or it was just very forgettable. I kind of went back and scrubbed through the footage to make sure that I didn't miss anything noteworthy, but I was kind of right. When there isn't a basic layer of city ambience, it's something really under the radar that doesn't draw your attention or express a whole lot of character. I wish I had some more uh, nostalgic leniency left, but I've been, I've been using a lot of it this whole time and, and I should recognize that. Well, this is awkward. See, as of right now, the game is technically abandonware, so I couldn't troll Steam or GOG for shitty hot takes on it. The most noteworthy thing I came across was a guy on Amazon who really didn't like Joshua's attitude when you make him inspect things that aren't important. What's even more irritating is the attitude and voice acting of the main character. I think they were going for a film noir style, but half the time, clicking on something useless would result in him simply saying, Nah. And at other times, though, you wouldn't even get that, but a simply shrug of the shoulders as if to say, what do you want me to do about it? I don't know why, but I found this attitude to be supremely annoying. There was also one very long negative review, but it caught my eye because it implied that the whole VST project mystery in the game had something to do with mind control? Like, he may be right there. Did, did I miss that? I guess it could have been that. Like, why not? So, for the handful of people that routinely comment that they don't like this segment instead of just skipping it, you're welcome. Nightlong, Union City Conspiracy, was an impressive effort from a country that hadn't yet made a name for itself in the gaming industry. And people seemed to enjoy it, they played it at least. Or 
the Sci-Fi Channel did. It's a charming throwback of a throwback in a time when this sort of thing was becoming harder to come across. There are better point-and-click adventure games out there, but you need something like Nightlong to fill the void in between. You know, sometimes when there's a dry spell, you gotta lower your standards a bit. Sometimes you gotta eat out of the trash. That's just... That's just the way things go, and that's okay. It's got a passable story that, according to that one review, I guess I didn't even understand, but I see it as a pleasant, generic jaunt through cyberspace dimensions. It's got only mildly frustrating puzzle logic, looks very charming, sounds fine. Worth a look if you're a point-and-click enthusiast, and if you've run out of higher tier options, and you can find a copy, and you look at it and think, this looks like something I would play. If you've got that far, you might be the kind of person that would like this game. Well, thank you for watching my video, and special thanks to Ailing Uncle, Resurrection, Game Master, Bayard Brown, This Deal Is Getting Worse All The Time, Nazim Kamal Ure, Mr. Benjamin, News Time, Karen Mavel, Dark Raptor 86, Charles Marr, Oisto, Alexander Sundin, Octo, Dylan Sorum, Alexander Smith, Joseph Zanoni, Nylanthrope, Daniel Person, Dos Days, and Sebastian Wappler for donating at the highest tier on my Patreon. I am endlessly grateful for all of your support. You guys are amazing. You're the best. Um, I, I hope this was t uh, to your liking. I, I, um, I don't want to disappoint you. I don't want to upset you in any way. It, it depends on you for a lot of things emotionally and financially. So, you know, you're important to me. I hope you're well. I hope you have a, a good I hope you have a good day. I hope work's going well. Um, here's a song. You let me in your home. I see a monochrome. I see a